It's the dying days of the Roaring Twenties, and the players on the Montreal Maroons are riding high for all the wrong reasons. In the Maroons' dressing room, this craze for stock market profits became so strong that on one occasion, when coach Eddie Girard called a practice, only one or two boys showed up. The rest were downtown counting their riches in the rising markets. On Thursday, October 24th, 1929, the bubble bursts. Without warning, North American stock markets crash. The lives of millions of Canadians are about to change dramatically. Going to a National Hockey League game has become a luxury people simply can't afford. Fans no longer line up to get into arenas. For the NHL, it's the start of a steep and sudden slide. Several teams fold. In the coming decade, professional hockey will struggle just to survive. But the game itself will thrive. It will become the country's most popular winter pastime. The passion it ignites will spread from coast to coast like wildfire. A new medium, radio, will transport the game to the most remote regions of the country. Hockey will become a source of inspiration and a breath of life that sustains the heart and spirit of a suffering nation. For a child, the sharp bite of a cold December day is the stuff dreams are made of. At 10 o'clock, after playing our games on Friday night, we will flood it. And I remember going back home at midnight because uh, it was windy. We were like an ice man. We wanted good ice for the Saturday where we play all day or Sunday. Uh, also, except for one hour, because we used to go to high mass. But uh, besides that, the rest of the time, we were on those uh, ice rink playing the game that we enjoyed. As the Depression hits hard in town and country, Canadians cling to what they have or whatever's left. For young Bernard Geoffrion, it's enough. Even during the hardest times, I never worried. I never needed anything. I had skates, a stick, and a puck. Our neighborhood was warm and tight-knit. All the families helped each other. For kids, hockey makes a friend of winter and lets them forget the misery of the Depression. In Saskatchewan, it's something young Gordy Howe knows well. 
My mom gave a couple of dollars to a woman who was in desperate need of milk for her family. The woman gave my mom a gunny sack full of things, including a pair of skates. We went outside and we pushed and glided around an ice pond. When my sister Edna got cold and took her skate off, I put it on my other foot. From that moment on, I loved skating. There is nothing to do. So, it's the depression. They have nothing. They have nothing to, to dream about. And you don't understand the situation. Why is it happening? And you always feel that what's happening to you is worse than what is happening to everybody else. So you have nothing to dream except you will be able to have your revenge on the ice rink, you know. And winning a game gives you a kind of gift that life will not give you. Hello, Canada, and hockey fans in the United States. Getting ready to start the second period, and there's no score. As this passion sweeps the country, a new tradition takes root. Hockey Night in Canada travels the airwaves and sweeps into the homes of millions of Canadians. Professional hockey is now a truly national game. Saturday evenings become sacred. Families gather round the radio to listen to Roland Baudry or Foster Hewitt. Holland then shoots it out at center. It slides down the ice and Reg Hamilton has it. Right off the edge of a stick. He shoots, he scores! If hockey can make heroes of ordinary men, Radio makes legends of heroes, like Howie Morenz. For young Denis Brodeur, radio opens a whole new world. In the evenings, we'd all get together to listen to the play-by-play -play of the game. Nothing could tear me away from the house. The next day on the ice, I tried to reenact the players' moves like I'd heard them described and the way I'd imagined them in my mind. Until that time, you had nothing that was immediate. And, uh, and all of a sudden, you had the voice across the country. They were these real national storytellers that connected people across the country and, and started to generate a game in the imagination and players in the imagination. And again, something that was far greater than could ever be in reality. And I think it, it's at that point that hockey really started to take off, you know, in, in this country. And, and not just at the highest levels, but also, you know, at, at the lower levels. As a new generation discovers the glories of hockey, the game tightens its hold on Canadian kids. Fired up with a passion for the game, they will become the talent pool that ensures its survival. Pro hockey might be going through hard times, but the roots of the game have never been stronger. As the game grows, Hockey's reach extends into the most remote corners of the country. In British Columbia's Fraser River Valley, a young man and a shaman take part in an age-old purification ritual. They draw from the spirit world the strength they need to confront the daily struggle. Many reserves live in extreme poverty, and Alec Antoine finds the courage to survive in a world of cold and ice. The Indians love the game. 
It gave them an opportunity to prove they were the best at a highly demanding sport. Hilary Place, the son of British immigrants, is impressed by Alec Antoine's skill. There were few hockey players as gifted as Alec Antoine. He needed just one stride to be in full flight. He turned with equal dexterity in either direction, and he skated backward with the puck better than most of the players could going forward. Young natives are taught the game in residential schools. It was intended to assimilate them into white culture. You're an Indian member of an Indian team, and it's the only place where you're allowed to be an Indian. You wearing that residential school uniform, playing against a non-Indian team. That's the only place in all of their lives through residential school where they actually could be Indians, and they could do something which is incredible. They could be proud of themselves because they could beat the white guys. They had been told for years and years and years that everything about their culture, their original culture, was bad. And here are this bunch of Indians which could beat those white kids. Now that was something else. Once they leave the 150-mile house residential school, the Shushwap natives sometimes find work at the Alkali Lake Ranch in the Caribou District. In the winter of 1927-28, the most passionate about hockey form a team, the Alkali Lake Braves, and join the BC Northern League. Winning the game was not the only thing that counted. For them, the sheer joy of the contest of skills was important. A quick turn around an opposing player, skating, turning, stick handling, all the skills that made hockey the fastest, toughest, and most elegant game ever devised by man were their delight. They played the game not only with grace and power and skill, but with their souls as well. Alec Antoine is the brave's heart and soul. He's got a hard, accurate shot. His ability to anticipate the play and his peripheral vision make him a formidable opponent. Games are played Sunday afternoons in Williams Lake. It's a long trip from the Alkali Lake Ranch. They leave early Saturday morning and get there after sundown. Color boundaries were there, and Indians were denied many things because of their race. Indians were not allowed in the hotels or in the restaurant. Instead, they shoveled the snow aside and pitched their tents. Supper was some deer meat and boiled frozen potatoes. A campfire was the only source of heat. Over the next few years, the Braves are almost unbeatable. In the 1930-31 season, they win the Northern British Columbia Championship. In January 1932, the Braves are invited to play two exhibition games against a professional team from the Vancouver area. They have never traveled this far from home. In Vancouver, the Braves are up against the Commercials, an all-star team used to big rinks and large crowds. This tournament was native activist Andy Paul's idea. He hopes that the Braves will inspire other First Nations. It will be the Indians' night to howl, we hope, and we of Squamish will have a 40-piece band at the game. We hope to play our boys off the ice to the strains of See the Conquering Heroes. The Braves are an attraction, but not everyone is impressed. 
The Alkalis start in pursuit of the puck when the whistle goes off and they never cease. There is little system, just dogged pursuit. They are still a primitive people, these silent, shadowy folk of the Northland, and they take their sport in the same way. The Vancouver Sun, January 16th, 1932. Doreen Arms and her husband Frank are from the Caribou District. They've come to watch the games. They had never played in front of so many people. The rink was quite a bit larger than they were used to, and they had no idea how to use the boards effectively, as the commercials hockey players did. The Braves lose both games to the commercials, but not by much. And even hard-bitten journalists admire their style. They did teach Vancouver one lesson. Hockey can be played absolutely without malice. They were beaten last night, and they took it with a smile. The crowd seemed to like that. Don't you? After their defeat, the Braves return to the Fraser River Valley and go about their usual business. But the depression is biting harder every day, and they can no longer afford to travel for hockey games. One day, Alec Antoine is killed. The story goes that lightning struck the fence he was working on. The team struggles all through the 30s, but it never recaptures the glory days when the Braves could hold their own with the best in the West. At about this time in Saskatchewan, a young boy takes his first steps on the ice. It's hard to say if he was inspired by the Braves, but this kid will make it to the top. 15 years later, Fred Sasakamus will play 11 games for the Chicago Blackhawks. He's recognized as the first player from a native reserve to make it to the NHL. Nineteen thirty-four. The country has been living through hard times for five years now, and even at a buck fifty, tickets for pro hockey games are too much for most fans. The National Hockey League is fighting for its life. Some teams are sold, others fold. Of the ten teams that made up the NHL in the late twenties, only six will survive the depression. The Ottawa Senators, seven-time winners of the Stanley Cup, will not. Fans turn to amateur hockey. For only 30 cents, they can watch the McGill University Redmen play the Junior Canadians. Teams like the Quebec Aces, the Halifax Wolverines, the Vancouver Lions, the Winnipeg Monarchs, and the Trail Smoke Eaters are packing them in. Jerry Heffernan plays for the Montreal Royals. Attendance at Sunday afternoon doubleheaders was on average 14,000. During the week, Wednesday night, it usually was about 8 to 10,000. The Montreal Canadiens were only drawing 3 to 5,000 on a Saturday night. Lionel Pilon plays center for the Junior Canadians. Anyone who wanted to hit me had better get up early in the morning. It was a rough, aggressive sport, but we respected each other and there were few dirty hits. The game was fast. It was tight checking and hard hitting. In Montreal, the clashes between English and French are as rough off the ice as on. The forum was packed on those nights. The fans in the seats created more mayhem than we did on the ice. The English were on one side and the French on the other. And it was bastard, bloody Frenchmen, you name it. Sometimes the screaming was so loud that we couldn't hear each other on the ice. There were times the atmosphere was so charged, the crowd so worked up, that fights would break out in the stands. 
Well, you have to understand, too, that at the time in Montreal, uh, the English and the French communities don't live together. They live s next to each other. So for them to be sort of shoved together in an arena is a unique uh, occasion. It's a un unique experience. And yes, there is friction. There are fights. Uh, you can see in some of the literature and, 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 and the poetry of the time that there were, you know, little rivalries and things going on inside and betting uh, between the two communities. So whether the owners play that up or not, certainly the fans recognize the differences between the two, and it was a point of tension, it was a point of intersection in the community. The English who thought they were superior and the French Canadians who were trying to prove something, together in the same barn, watching a hockey game with something to prove. The success of the amateur leagues comes at the expense of the NHL. Even the rivalry between the Canadians and the Maroons is no longer enough to pack the forum. In 1934, Leo Dandurand, the man who created the myth of Les Glorieux, does the unthinkable. He trades Howie Morenz. To the fans who worshipped him, this is nothing short of treachery. I was getting hundreds of phone calls every day. People would stop me on the street to tell me what they thought. You know, everyone was giving me hell. But even without Morenz's salary, the team's balance sheet gets worse. Dan Duran sees no other option. The headlines on Monday, September 16th, 1935, scream out the news. The Canadian Hockey Club is sold. The Canadians' new owners are the very English Montreal Arena Company. The same group also owns the Forum and the Maroons. Play is again in Canadian territory, Joliet at Center Ice with Moran. In the fall of 1936, in a desperate bid to boost attendance, they bring back Howie Morenz. Aurel Joliet is reunited with his longtime line mate. And he shoots, he scores for the Canadians. When he returned to Montreal in a Canadian's uniform, the ladies were in their seats with a rousing and welcome as any five male fans put together. Myrtle Cook the Montreal Daily Star. Later that season, during a game against the Chicago Blackhawks, Morenz is checked hard and slams into the boards. His left leg is fractured in several places. When Joliat visits his friend in hospital, he finds Morenz weak and demoralized. Howie suddenly decided to show me he could walk across the room on his crutches. I saw him totter as he started back. I grabbed him and helped him back to bed. He kind of smiled at me and told me, I'll be up there watching you in the playoffs. That was about the last thing he said to me. During the night of March 8th, 1937, Howie Morenz dies of complications caused by a pulmonary embolism. His body lies in state at the Montreal Forum. More than 20,000 fans come to pay their last respects to a man they'd idolized. For Camille Desroches, it's easy to understand why Morenz was so loved and admired. I think the best way to explain it is that to us, Morenz was as French Canadian as we were, even though he wasn't. It's as simple as that. For the Montreal Canadiens, the death of Howie Morenz marks the beginning of a long decline. The team finishes the season dead last in the standings. The final home game draws fewer than 1,500 fans. Ray Getliff feels he's playing for no one. As the season wore on and we kept losing, all we could see when we were playing were empty seats. Nothing but empty seats. Without the fans, the Canadians' Maroons rivalry runs out of steam. The Montreal Arena Company, which owns both teams, decides it can only afford to back one and goes with the Francophone team. The Maroons get the ax. Even so, the Canadians barely manage to survive until one day, a fierce and talented rookie steps on the ice.
During the winter of 1930, a 17-year-old girl, desperate to fight off the season's boredom, goes out to challenge the bitter cold. Young Hilda Renscombe and her sister Nellie take up the challenge thrown her way by a neighborhood boy. They put together a hockey team, the Preston Rivulets. We didn't have any trouble learning hockey. We used to skate up and down on the Speed River and on the Grand River. Hilda and Nellie Ranscombe are not oddities. Across Canada, women's hockey is growing in popularity, and young girls from all walks of life are joining teams like the Crystal Sisters from PEI, the Haleybury Black Cats, the Port Dover Sailorettes, and the Calgary Grills. In Preston, a small town in the heart of southern Ontario's industrial belt, the Rivulets already dominate the provincial league. They're soon the team to beat at the national level as well. Bobby Rosenfeld, a hockey star in her own right in the 1920s, is now a journalist. Hilda Branscombe looks invincible with a puck and a stick. She has all the equipment for stardom. She's an instinctive performer. In home competition or on foreign ice, she is the same gifted player. Almost all of the rivulets hold day jobs in the area's mills and factories. They're used to long hours and hard physical labor six days a week. We worked together as a team. There were no stars. We were always together, and no matter what happened, we played together. All the girls were so good that nobody could beat us. I think the people must have liked us because there was always a full house at the Galt Arena. The Rivulets just keep on winning. They travel the whole country defending their championship against all comers. To cover expenses, they dip into their own savings and rely on the help of a few generous backers. Everywhere, every game, they display the same steely will to win. They never back down, never turn away. The girls roughed it up a little in the second period when 11 of the 17 penalties were handed out. Helen Ransom of Winnipeg and Marm Schmuck of the Rivulets dropped their sticks and gloves and exchanged a number of full swing blows that had the crowd gasping. Montreal Daily Star, March 26, 1935. Gladys Pitcher is 16. She works in a cardboard box factory in Galt. She's not afraid to mix it up. Don't kid yourself. If somebody hooked you, you turned around and let them have it. Somebody might have had three stitches here and three stitches there, but what's three stitches? The hockey takes over. They get the fire. If it got a little rough, it got a little rough. Hockey allows what we don't want to see in society to come out onto the ice. And, and women played quite a hard, hard hitting, quite a, quite a vicious game. Women were expected to be nicer, so maybe you know, a woman hitting another woman with a body check was seen to be that much more outrageous for its time. But the fact is, even the women who played will tell you that women can be quite, quite as violent um, with, with each other on the game. The Rivulets play the Crystal Sisters in Charlottetown for the Eastern Championship. Ruth Dargell is a 14-year-old rookie. Her day job is packaging whiskey bottles at the Seagram's factory in Waterloo. We were billeted in a beautiful hotel and taken on a horse and buggy tour that included the Parliament buildings. Then we had a fabulous dinner. We felt a little like royalty. We won our games and had national coverage. Oh, I also received the roughing penalty. Between 1930 and 1940, the Rivulets lose only twice in 350 games. They win 10 provincial championships, 10 Eastern Division championships, and six national titles. The only thing that stops their incredible run is the start of the Second World War. The Preston Rivulets were then quickly forgotten. I got married and gave up hockey, but I will never forget 
the excitement and pride of being one of the pioneers of a sport that I love. At most, there are only 200 players at a time in the NHL. Chances of making it to that level and earning a living there are very slim. With the depression still deepening, many young men decide that the only way to survive is to leave the country. Jerry Heffernan is among those who head off to Europe. The jobs were scarce unless one had a trade, and money from hockey was just about enough to last for a five-month season. When the word got around that the money was better in England, there was no lack of players ready to make the trip. Heffernan is one of the many Canadians who swell the ranks of British teams like the Wembley Lions and the Herringay Racers. Europe is catching hockey fever. Dès le début, le jeu est extrêmement rapide, mais la défense veille et aucun but n'est marqué au cours de la première phase. The game is catching on in France as well. Players like Jacques Mousset, Larry Laframboise, Jacques and Antoine Cholette, and Frankie Cadoret are a sensation. Montreal's Roger Godet is captain of Paris' team, Les Francais Volants, the flying Frenchmen. The Volants are fast. Roger Godet, their captain, is caged lightning, the burst of speed that puts him with the speediest puck chases in Europe. This is Godet's third year with the Volants, and he is traveling left wing better than ever. Almost all my teammates came from Quebec. We went to all the great capitals, Prague, Vienna, Budapest, Berlin, London, and Paris. We would play 80 games a season, which scrambled from one place to the next. It wasn't always easy. We often attracted crowds of 20,000 spectators. You couldn't get a job in a lot of parts of Canada, certainly a job that paid the kind of money that you could get to go barnstorm. Second, you could do something you loved, overseas and be a hero. And hockey wasn't seen as a game per se, it was a spectacle, uh, like the Harlem Globetrotters or like when the American baseball players went to Japan, it was a traveling circus. And to be part of that, a young man traveling and getting money at the time, why wouldn't you go? Why would you want to stay back in Canada with the depression? The Francais Volants are living the high life in Paris. Here, a good player can earn up to $2,000 a season. Back home, the same player would make no more than $300 in a semi-pro league. The Volants are a hit all over Europe. They're often invited to play in England, where their flashy style is a novelty. The Volants, like most French teams, are temperamental. If the English Channel hasn't knocked spunk and speed out of them, the Herringay Racers will have their work cut out. On the other hand, if these French boys from Montreal and Quebec are moody, their play will go sky high and the Racers will skate off easy winners. While French and English Canadian players are filling arenas in France and England, a young man from Trail, BC, heads off to Czechoslovakia, where his parents were born. Mike Buckner takes in a hockey game at Prague's Ice Palace and meets Czech coach Yuri Todzika. I gave him skates, a stick and a puck. His skating and his moves, his lightning speed were new to us. And you could see how happy he was doing it. And that's how we finally got a coach that we could understand and especially who understood us. He gave us the urge to learn all over again because Bukna was fired up and lived totally for hockey. As a player and assistant coach for the national team, Mike Buckner teaches the Czechs the fine points of the game. I taught them all that stuff which was purely Canadian. I showed them that when you take a man, you take him all the way, instead of giving him just a little push. I taught them passing plays, breakouts, and quick releases. And that's not all. Buckner crisscrosses the country, holds hockey clinics, and sets up minor hockey leagues everywhere 
Soon, the Czechs are the dominant hockey power in Europe. I converted them to a different attitude where instead of being content to lose by a goal or two, you keep driving. That's the beauty of hockey, see? It's possible to reverse the trend of a game as long as you don't give up. Thousands of young Czechoslovakian boys want to become the next Mike Buckna. But Buckna finds time for more than just hockey. He falls in love. Her name? Lola Frolikova. On March 15, 1939, German troops march into Czechoslovakia and annex it to the Third Reich. Mike, with Lola, heads back to Canada. A few months later, Europe is engulfed in war. All of the Canadians who were playing hockey overseas come back home. But they leave behind a legacy, a passion for the game that will continue to grow. Mike Buckner's special contribution does not go unnoticed. He is officially acknowledged as the father of Czechoslovak hockey. December. 1939. While the National Hockey League is well into its regular season, 7,500 men with the 1st Canadian Division are in training in Great Britain. They're getting ready to launch a counterattack against Germany. But it's a long wait, and finding ways to keep morale high and maintaining discipline is a challenge. Just then, the Canadian Army High Command receives an astonishing proposal. Gilles Turcot played for the Junior Quebec Aces. Now he's a lieutenant in the Royal 22nd Regiment. Before the war, all the players of the English League were Canadians. When the war broke out, they all came back to Canada. So as early as January 1940, the managers of the English League went to see General McNaughton and made him an offer. If you want to form a league, will pay all the expenses, so General McNaughton said yes. There are thousands of good hockey players in the ranks. All they need is equipment, and they're ready to play until their day to fight the real war arrives. This extraordinary arrangement allows the British Hockey League to fill its arenas through the war by offering high-caliber Canadian-style hockey. The team was made up of enlisted men and officers. We practiced once a week and played once a week. It was like a real hockey season. On top of playing hockey, we had our military training with all the maneuvers and marching. We were in shape. We were in great shape. It was a way of connecting with the uh, host, uh, hosting population. Uh, also in training, it was a way of building the, the group. And it was also a way of bringing some uh, part of Canada with them. And if can bring a bit of the game, then your soldiers will feel like at home. And if they feel comfortable, they will uh, they will forget about nostalgia, about missing. And also, let's say those people were living together. And playing arcade was a way of solving some uh, differences that they could have. So it, le it let the steam out. So that was the role of arcade in Europe. Um, Back in North America, the NHL carries on through the war. About 60 established NHL players enlist, but most of them end up playing for military hockey teams. They'll fight their war 
on Canadian ice rinks because the government considers hockey an essential contribution to public morale. Kenny Reardon of the Montreal Canadiens finds himself playing for the Ottawa Commandos. A team from Toronto made of Air Force guys had won the Allen Cup in Canadian senior hockey. They had the Kraut line of Schmidt, Dumart, and Bauer from Boston. So the Army put together a team in Ottawa, the Commandos, and I was on it. We had some good players, the Colville brothers and Shibiki. They were on a line that had played for the Rangers. We were lucky enough to win the Allen Cup. When the war ends, hundreds of thousands of soldiers come home. They return to a very different country. The Depression is over. A new era of prosperity is beginning. Radio has rooted hockey everywhere. It's become the national game, and it feeds the dreams of men like Richard, Howe, Sacha, and Platt. Television will bring a new dimension to the game and make icons of its stars. The NHL and the game are on the threshold of a new and glorious era.